Good morning, church. Welcome to the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Today we finish the series on the Holy Spirit that we began in the first part of June. Remember, we have studied over these four Sundays the person of the Holy Spirit, and secondly, the pardon of the Holy Spirit. Last Sunday, the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I talked last Sunday about the way in which the presence of the Holy Spirit is comforting. It is comfort, but it is also challenge and change of the heart. Today, we conclude by emphasizing this wonderful power of the Holy Spirit. And once again, as in last Sunday, I'll be talking about contrasts between human weakness and God's power, between the weakness of our abilities and expressions and the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember, our church posts not just the worship service, but other ministry matters on our Facebook page, Dewajak's First United Methodist Church. And again, I thank Jacob Peters and Dan Peters for helping us put together our online YouTube worship services for each and every Sunday morning. We are still aiming to hold our in-person, back-in-the-church-sanctuary worship on Sunday, July 12th. My phone number is 269-462-5317. Give me a call if I can be of help. I will still be continuing that tradition I developed during the spring of getting out and around to front porches and driveways and patios and safely looking in on folks and saying hi. So if you have a need, please do be in touch with me. I am on the road a lot, but I have my phone with me and want to be available to you. Next month, we will begin a sermon series on the book of Revelation. This series will begin on Sunday, next Sunday, the 5th of July, and we will focus on the Revelation all through July and August. How did I come to suggest that we study the Revelation together? Well, for one thing, I've had many conversations about Scripture with people in the driveways, out at the gas station or in the grocery store, what have you, on the back porch. And what I've come to hear is that the book of Revelation is a book that is often thought to be mysterious, which it certainly is, but also scary. And it has been an idea that has worked on my heart, and I would like to suggest that we read through parts of the Revelation and focus not on simply the dramatic imagery or the gory imagery or the things that our culture has taken to scare us, but that we focus on the promise of redemption. The book of Revelation is, as I say, a glimpse of the coming day. In other words, a foretaste of God being in control, God's authority, God's coming kingdom, and that that's great promise. So we can look at this with a little different angle of vision. We do have the DVDs of our Sunday services for those folks who aren't able to connect online. So if you know of someone who's not able to watch with you or with others, and they would like a disc so that they could uh, manually place the disc in a player and watch our services at home, please let me know. Also, you uh, either have already received or will receive within a day or two probably uh, the letter that we sent out from the church office. We've begun a custom of sending out a small newsletter and some updates near the very end of each month. And if it has not arrived in your box yet, it will soon. So be looking for that uh, U.S. Uh, mail, postal service, old-fashioned newsletter in your box. Let's join one more time 
one last time as we close the series on the Holy Spirit in our call to worship from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all God's benefits. And forget not all God's benefits. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, our living hope, we long for your glory and power. Our hearts open to you. Like a mighty wind, fill us and send us to love. Baptize us with your fire. Spirit of truth, teach us all things and bring to remembrance the words and the deeds of Jesus. Guide us into all truth. Give us power in our weakness to speak the word of God with boldness and to live the word of God for others. Amen. In keeping with our readings of the Old Testament by focusing on the book of Psalms, I read from Psalm number 13, verses 1 through 6. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemies will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trust in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. And reading from the New Testament epistle or letter, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. And reading from the Gospel, Matthew 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. 
Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Lord God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts scattered and yet in your divine power assembled for worship be acceptable unto you our strength and our Redeemer. Way back in the 1870s in the wilderness of what was then thought to be northern Michigan, really more central western Michigan in Macosta County, that's north of Grand Rapids, back in the 1870s, there lived a young woman, barely out of her teens, really, and her name was Anna Howard Shaw. She had been born out east in Massachusetts, but her family wanted to move west and Michigan Territory, or the state of Michigan, that is, in the 1870s, was then considered, of course, the West, among other places. And young Anna studied and became a very devout Christian as a young woman. She became so devoted to Jesus Christ that she struggled with a call to ministry. This was, of course, in days when women were not always affirmed to be pastors. And yet, Anna was convinced that she was called to preach the Word of God. It so happened that the district superintendent of the Methodist Church up in Macosta County, Michigan, took a liking to young Anna and saw in her powerful potential. Oh, not because she was necessarily wise, she was a very young person still learning about life, and not necessarily because this district superintendent had heard her preach, but he believed that the Spirit of God was working powerfully in her life. And so the superintendent said, Anna, we're having a gathering of many church leaders and representatives from around this part of Michigan in a month or so, over in this small village of Ashton, would you be our preacher for the worship service that day? Anna was both thrilled and then, of course, terrified because she was not an experienced preacher. She did not consider herself to be an eloquent young person, but she loved Jesus Christ with all of her heart, and so she prepared to preach that worship service. On the appointed day, she said in her recollections, she stepped into this modest pulpit and she sort of leaned on it and used it as, as her prop and as a place of stability to help her. And she said, somehow I managed to stumble through my prepared sermon. She said, the one thing I did notice, and it gave me uh, some unsettling moments, is that the kerosene lantern that was on a table near the pulpit seemed to shake because my hands were shaking at the pulpit and rattling that part of the room a little bit. She said, that kerosene lamp, began to shake, and I swear to goodness I could see the oil sloshing back and forth and the flame flickering. She was terrified. 
and not standing on her own confidence, but somehow trusting in the Holy Spirit's power to speak through her. And she spoke to many people that day, and Anna did become one of the very first women ordained to ministry in America. She went on to earn a medical degree in addition to her seminary degree and became a noted physician and preacher. And in the early part of the 20th century, Anna Howard Shaw became a leader of the women's effort to receive the right to vote in America. This very timid person who did not stand on her own strength but leaned on the strength of the Holy Spirit's power, became one of the most impressive Christian witnesses in all of America. I share that story because I was reminded of that when I read the Apostle Paul's words. Speaking to the people in Corinth, Greece, people who thought of themselves as sophisticated people, people in a cosmopolitan region of the first century, people who appreciated the finer things, finer performances, the study of Greek rhetoric and other forms of expression. These folk met this humble man, Saul, who became Paul, and this man said, that he did not come to them in any kind of reliance on human wisdom, polish, performance, and prestige. But he stood among them simply as one who wished to preach Christ and him crucified. And in his weakness and his weakness of expression and speech, Paul said, I came to be a witness through my weakness to the Spirit's power, the Spirit's power. I notice many things in this passage that draw me to some conclusions regarding the Holy Spirit. And once again, friends, I share with you the way in which I'm struck by the reference to the Spirit that is yet again connected to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul stood in his human weakness, in his insufficient skill, and yet he represented the movement of the Spirit's power. And all of that was done in the context of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't have one person of the Trinity without having the other two as a part of the relationship. And here, Paul's very instance of being a conduit, a weak human conduit for the Spirit's power revolved around him preaching the gospel of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. Last week I talked about the way in which Paul often spoke about contrasts in the life of faith. I talked about the way at some points you might think that Paul spent an entirety of his energy on the contrast between law and grace. And yet Paul, in the reading from Romans 8 that I considered last week, did not contrast law and grace so much as he did flesh and spirit. The passage from Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 is somewhat like this. There is, once again, a contrast. But here it is not a contrast between flesh and and spirit so much as a contrast between human weakness and spiritual power. 
Paul's reference to the power, if you will, of the Holy Spirit to work through us is embedded in Paul's understanding of himself and others as weak human vessels. This means, my friends, that the Holy Spirit works through us not because we may be eloquent, not because we may have skills, not because we have accomplished things, not because we have achieved things, not because we may muster some grand performance. The Holy Spirit speaks through us as a power beyond any of these human qualities. And in fact, the Holy Spirit often does its most powerful work in the midst of our weakness. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit does its most powerful work, or some of the most powerful work, in the midst of our human weakness. Paul is embodying in this scripture the power of the cross of Jesus Christ to save. When the cross of Jesus Christ was to the world a sign of weakness and failure and death. Paul was embodying to the Corinthians who often did not want to hear from anyone unless that person was pedigreed and polished. That the power of God working through the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is a power that comes not in human capability, but from beyond and through human frailty. Jesus Christ illustrated this in his own life. The great king who was to come and who did in fact come died a humble death on the cross and yet was raised from the dead. Folks, Jesus Christ did not fit the type of the impressive and dare I say it, charismatic leader. He was truly God and truly human and accepted unto himself a kind of weakness in order to reveal the power of God. You see the irony in that contrast? This was Paul. This was Paul who did not have to fake his weakness because he was all too human and frail. This was Paul, who wished through his weakness to be a vessel of the Spirit's power in the midst of one of the metropolises that seemed to ridicule human weakness and be in love with human achievement, capability, and human power. This Paul knew that if he simply spoke truth regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit would shine brighter than it would in any other situation. This is Paul. But Paul, of course, was not Christ. And so Paul, like us, spoke a word of honesty about his own imperfection, his own lack of capability. He did not have to assume that as a kind of condescension so much as an honesty of acceptance of himself. I'm reminded of the times in history when the greatest thing often were at first considered to be of little merit. How some of the greatest deeds and the greatest speeches even started out 
as matters that were overlooked because they were not necessarily impressive by human standards. I think of the Gettysburg Address of Abraham Lincoln in November of 1863, 272 words that have come down to us as words of exquisite power because, in many respects, they were offered so humbly. You remember the Gettysburg Address was shared in the context of a solemn dedication of the National Cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And for this occasion, the organizers had invited Edward Everett, the great speechmaker, former college president of Harvard, a man known for his erudition, his great learning, if you will, his polished speech, his insight, his human wisdom. And we're told that Edward Everett held forth for about two hours, two hours, rehearsing all of the deeds that had been done by the leaders of the Union forces at the Battle of Gettysburg, speaking with such eloquence that, that it was met with excitement. And yet, after Edward Everett had spoken, President Lincoln stood and shared 272 words that have gone down in history. It's said that following that address to Mr. Everett's credit, he made a remark to Abraham Lincoln that went something like this. Mr. President, I should fancy myself if I thought that I approached the idea of the occasion in two hours. <laughs> when you, in fact, did so in two minutes. Edward Everett knew that he had all of the culture's presumption about quality and prestige at his grasp, and yet Abraham Lincoln had, in effect, bested him with this humble little talk. What is it about that speech that spoke so powerfully? Well, it was a speech of ordinary words that pointed to the extraordinary. It was a speech of ordinary words that pointed to the extraordinary. There was a moment in the Gettysburg Address, if you look it up, where President Lincoln is speaking about the sacrifice of the Union soldiers who had laid down their lives for the country. And he used this language. He said, the world will little know nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It's a contrast, much like that emphasized by the Apostle Paul. A contrast between mere speech and action. Between saying something and being faithful about doing something. Now, we, we know that President Lincoln was wrong because we do note and long remember what he said there. But the power of that speech is in its humility. Is in its apparent weakness is in the way it points beyond itself to something more powerful, something higher. Friends, whenever someone describes a religious, spiritual, or other kind of leader to you as a, quote, charismatic, end quote, person, be careful. Whenever the supposed power of a witness is lodged in the person of a human being, there is trouble to follow. Paul knew that. Paul knew that the most powerful work 
of God through the Holy Spirit takes place in the humble moment. Just as Abraham Lincoln knew that the most powerful matter at stake was not what he said, was not how he looked, was not how he spoke, but in the power of the sacrifice that had taken place in that place. This is good news because we may see ourselves in all of our weakness and in all of our insufficiency as, like Paul, vessels of the Spirit's power. And that is real power. When you go about your day and your week and you share Christ and Him crucified, a humble message and a humbling message, you are in fact serving as a most sufficient vehicle for the work of the Holy Spirit. Take comfort. Take comfort. The Holy Spirit works most powerfully in moments of perceived weakness. Amen. We've arrived at our time of pastoral prayer and Lord's Prayer. I would suggest that we handle this time much like we did a few weeks ago where we prayed silently together. And then I offered the Lord's Prayer in word. I do this so that we may collect ourselves wherever we are and name in our hearts or maybe with friends who may be participating in the service with us, name people to be lifted up and then close our time with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray silently. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are privileged to bring before us this Lord's Day the tithes and offerings that have been given, mailed, sent, However, into the church community, we're so grateful for these gifts. They mean an awful lot, and we do count on them. I give gratitude to each and every one of you every day of my life. And this is our opportunity to give thanks for these gifts and to dedicate them to the Lord's work. Let's pray. God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts to you. 
through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The closing hymn may not be one that we think of immediately when contemplating the Holy Spirit. And yet it has lyrics that do speak of the Spirit's power to guide and to move. The hymn is number 408, The Gift of Love, 408. It is a hymn that is really drawn from 1 Corinthians 13. And just as we've reflected on the meaning of the second chapter in that letter, this is the reference to Paul's love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. But notice these words, Come, Spirit, come. Our hearts control our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. Though I may speak with bravest fire and have the gift to all inspire and have not love my words are vain as sounding brass and hopeless gain come spirit come our hearts control our spirits long to be made whole, let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. Go now in the knowledge and love of God, the Creator Almighty, and in the grace of the crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.